harm reduction today. I thought it would be an interesting um, break from the focus of what you've been talking about so far this morning. And I titled my talk, Centering Harm Reduction in the U.S. Opioid Response. I'm really going to center us in the science of harm reduction and go through two interventions that I've been involved in evaluating, one in Vancouver, which is where I'm from in Canada, uh, and the other, as Susan mentioned, I've been working on here at Brown around fentanyl testing. And then I'll really leave it up to you and during the discussion on identifying how we can center these programs in the public policy response and in the court of public opinion where we see a lot of controversy of these programs. Hi, Tom. Um, so, so that's what I'm hoping to do today. Uh, so uh, this is what we're focusing on this morning, um, the overdose crisis in the U.S., which uh, in 2017 claimed more than 70,000 lives, almost 200 people a day now die of drug overdose in the United States. And that's greater than the HIV AIDS epidemic at its peak in 1995 and greater than the number of deaths due to gun violence as well. So it's a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the nation at this point. Uh, one way to look at the data is also geographically. I spend a lot of time looking at maps in my work, and when we look at the national picture, in 1999, overdose rates uh, were really clustered, high rates were really clustered in parts of Appalachia, which is where the epidemic really took off, and then also in New Mexico and parts of the Midwest. And this is what overdose death rates by county looked like in 2015. High rates across the nation, rural, urban, you'll see blue states, red states, highly affected. I often tell my students that this is a crisis that affects you know, almost every family across the nation at this point in some direct or indirect way. We still see differential patterns of overdose though. Some of the highest rates remain in Appalachia, West Virginia, and also here in New England. New Hampshire has the second highest rate of overdose. Rhode Island was uh, third and fifth, and now we're 11th. So I'll talk about some progress we've been making. But that's also due to other states which have eclipsed us, uh, like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. One paper that came out in science last year, which was probably my favorite paper of the year, um, shockingly looked at the overdose epidemic over longer decades than most of us epidemiologists would, would bother with. And what they found was a very disturbing trend, almost a perfect exponential growth in drug overdose mortality really back from the 1980s. Uh, so this is an exponential growth, and that one uh, line explains 99% of the variation in drug overdose over time. So that's alarming, right? If we were to continue on that trend, you can extrapolate, we'd be looking at hundreds of thousands of deaths relatively in the near future. So our goal as epidemiologists, public health, public policy people is to bend this curve. When you look at this national figure when we combine all drug overdose mortality and we break it down by substance, it's where we start to see a much more interesting and um, variegated picture. So I'll just take you through this yellow line here are drugs that are unspecified. This is another problem. We're actually quite bad at coding the drugs that cause deaths in some places in the United States, so many remain unspecified. Um, but cocaine is, 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 a, is a problem as well. It was actually one of the leading causes of overdose death in the mid-2000s. The blue line are prescription opioids, uh, Oxycontin, Vicodin, so you see that peak really in the mid to late 2000s at the height of our prescription opioid epidemic. Heroin then kicking off really in 2011, that's the red line. And now what I'll be talking about today predominantly is fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid. That class of opioids, fentanyl really driving that pattern shown in that gold line, really peaking up to the top in 2011. So a little bit about fentanyl, which I'm going to be talking about. This is a synthetic opioid. It's highly potent, about 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Uh, so therefore, you need only a very small amount of the substance to have the same effect as a much larger dose of heroin. This figure shows a lethal dose of heroin compared to a lethal, lethal dose of fentanyl. Just a couple grains of salt worth of fentanyl is enough to cause an overdose and subsequent mortality. 
So a lot of, you know, there's a lot of reasons why the epidemic has shifted to fentanyl, which we can talk about. One reason is that it's much easier to traffic and the profits are much, much larger. It's synthetic, so you can make it completely in a lab. You don't have to process it from the opioid plant. Um, so it's both easier to make, easier to, tra uh, to traffic, easier to sell. Um, and so the profits on the illicit side are very, very large. One thing that I've been starting to look at and other scholars have as well epidemiologically is trying to explain why parts of the United States are so heavily affected by fentanyl overdose specifically. And one of the primary hypotheses has to do with the types of heroin that are circulating in the illicit drug market. There's really three types of heroin, brown, black tar, and white. Um, brown heroin is the base of heroin, chemically known as diamorphine. Uh, it burns at a much, much lower temperature, and so it's easier to smoke. Uh, you can dissolve it, but that would have to be done in an acid. Uh, so it's relatively difficult to inject. And this is much, uh, much more common on the West Coast than here on the East Coast. Black tar heroin is predominantly trafficked from Mexico. It's sort of a low-quality product, uh, sort of half-processed. Um, which is used in parts of New Mexico along the border. And then for a long time on the East Coast, we have a predominance of white heroin, which is the hydrochloride version of heroin, which is a salt. So it dissolves very easily in water and therefore can be eject injected much more easily than these other types of heroin. What you also notice, notice that the color is important. Fentanyl is white, so it's much easier to contaminate white heroin with fentanyl than these other products. And again, we see white heroin really dominate everywhere east of the Mississippi. One um, way to visualize this is to split out the drug overdose rates by states west versus east of the Mississippi. So this is something one of my undergrads has been working on, trying to describe rates of overdose by state. Uh, so what you can see here, this comes from CDC Wonder, is right around 2012, we see the mortality rates from overdose take off east of the Mississippi. Really, west remain fairly you know, stable along this linear line. And we believe that's due to the introduction of fentanyl, really focused on that white heroin market, which is in the northeast and in the mid-Atlantic predominantly. There's a lot of variation, though, in these larger trends. So this is something I'm really interested in, is understanding which states are doing well, which are not doing well, and how to figure out where we're making progress and how to replicate that. So this is a figure that my student put together. It's basically looking at drug overdose rates in 2011, and then looking at percent increases by state over time. So this is kind of standardizing to the overdose burden within each state in 2011. So it gives you a different picture. You can see the states east of the Mississippi are mostly heavily affected. Maryland and DC have grown the largest from where they were in 2011. Rhode Island actually has done quite well. Relative to our burden in 2011, which was very high, we've seen less of an increase than some of our neighboring states when, a, when you look at percentages like Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And then the states west of the Mississippi really have not seen as much increase as we have here on the east. Here in Rhode Island, I'll just show a little bit of data. This is broken down by fentanyl overdoses and non-fentanyl overdoses over time. You can see the emergence of the fentanyl epidemic now really driving overdose deaths in our state. 2018 data is still preliminary, but so far this year, about 70% of our deaths involve fentanyl or related analog. Our non-fentanyl overdose deaths have actually been decreasing and continue to decrease in 2018. Uh, so really, in Rhode Island, we have a fentanyl epidemic at this point, at least in terms of death. So that's partly sort of the underlying what we've seen in terms of the backgrounds of trends. What I want to do now is shift and focus how we can think about harm reduction um, related to other treatment and uh, policy interventions we have in our toolbox. So I'm working with a mathematician in Vancouver right now, and he showed this lovely equation. It distills the whole problem down into four variables. So I, I loved how simple and straightforward with the, that this was. Uh, so how to over, decrease overdose deaths. So you have to, you know, I'm going to focus on deaths. I, I'm interested in decreasing mortality due to, due to overdose. So that's D, the number of overdose deaths per year, is really a function of three things the number of people that are at risk for overdose each year, which is the N, the rate at which those people overdose, which is beta, 
And then not every overdose is fatal, right? So there's another rate here, which is the rate of death per overdose. And so when we're thinking of interventions or public policy levers, where I want to see them map onto is one or more of these terms. An effective intervention should be those that decrease one or more of these variables. So I've been thinking about this equation a little bit, and I've, I've kind of come to four conclusions, which I want to highlight. The first is that fentanyl is a game changer because it's influencing all three of these terms. Fentanyl now broadly contaminates the, uh, uh, definitely the illicit opioid supply and increasingly the stimulant supply as well, cocaine and uh, methamphetamine. So people who didn't used to be at risk of, overdose, uh, of opioid overdose now very much are. So fentanyl is increasing the number of people at risk. It's a highly potent opioid, so the risk of overdose is much higher, that's the beta. And it's a very severe overdose symptomatology. People have severe respiratory depression and other symptoms that are much more fatal, so it's increasing that last term as well. So fentanyl is a huge problem. The other thing to note is that each term is equally important. Reducing the number of people at risk has the same impact as on deaths as reducing the risk of overdose by 10%. So you can each focus on each of these terms and each are important and each are equally important. Ideally what you want to do are design interventions that impact more than one term. That's where I really think we have the most bang for our buck is designing interventions that both decrease the risk of overdose among people at risk and decreasing the total number who remain at risk in the population. And that's really what we're trying to do in Rhode Island, is have a multi-pronged approach to map onto all of these terms. Now, where I think you see a lot of debate in this room and many other places is where interventions try to decrease one of these terms, but people worry about increasing another. So you have this example with supply reduction interventions. Interventions that are well-meaning, like to discontinue people abruptly off opioid therapy or close pill mills, make an attempt to decrease the number of people at risk, but it may shift those people to the illicit opioid market, which dramatically increases their risk of overdose. So interventions can do one thing well and then actually have harm on the other side. So that's something we need to pay attention to, and I think a lot of us in this room, this is where we should focus, is on evaluating these accidental consequences of our interventions. So the way I think of this is that prevention and treatment and also recovery, I should add here, are really trying to minimize the decrease the number of people at risk from overdose. Naloxone and rescue are on the other side. They're trying to basically revive people who have already overdosed and prevent mortality. So that's where those interventions fit. Harm reduction is really in the middle. It's trying to decrease the risk of overdose among people who are using. Now, this is sort of arbitrary how I've bucketed these interventions. As I mentioned, they should really all work together. And I think what I want to show you today is we have interventions that are harm reduction focused, but also may be a pathway into treatment for people, or that may have some sort of preventive effect. And likewise, you can imagine sort of street outreach focusing on naloxone, but also talking to people about treatment. So I don't mean to suggest that these interventions should operate in silo. They really should all work together. That's, again, where you're going to see the biggest bang for your buck. So I'm going to focus the rest on harm reduction. Uh, so just what, are, what is harm reduction? This broadly refers to policies and programs and practices that aim to minimize the negative consequences of drug use, drug policy, and, and drug laws. So that's the broad definition of harm reduction we're going to work with today. So I want to talk about two interventions that I've been involved in that are both considered harm reduction programs. The first are supervised consumption facilities. So this was from my PhD. I was uh, working on the evaluation of a supervised consumption center in Vancouver, which was the first in North America to do this. And I want, as I, as I work through what this intervention is, I want you to think how it's trying to reduce one or more of those terms in that equation. Uh, so what are medically supervised consumption facilities? These are clinics, medical clinics, where people uh, consume pre-obtained illicit substances. Okay, so drugs are not provided on site, they're brought in, um, but are supervised. And at these centers, clinics can also access other services, usually addiction treatment programs, health programs, and referrals to social services. 
in terms of terminology, many clinics only permit injection drug use, like the one I'll be talking about in Vancouver, so we say a in supervised injection facility, or SIF in this case. These are quite common in other countries. More than 100 exist now in Canada and many places in Europe. None exist in the United States. Uh, and there's a lot of active policy discussion right now on whether these merit implementation in this country. We can talk about some legal challenges with doing that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how Insight was opened in Vancouver and how we can compare that to what you might see in the US today. So this is what the facility looks like. It's in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is a highly affected neighborhood uh, in the city where approximately five to 8,000 people who inject drugs reside in a very small, dense neighborhood. Kind of like the Tenderloin District in San Francisco would be the closest American equivalent. Uh, this is the entrance to the facility here, um, and this is the exit. I really love this photo because it shows a couple of things. First, you see a police cruiser right outside. Uh, so, you know, you can't implement these interventions in silo. They really need to work with the police and law enforcement. So when this facility was opened, Vancouver Police Department policy changed so that if they see someone injecting on the street, the policy would be to refer them, actually physically walk them to the center rather than uh, arrest or, or diversion. Uh, so that's part and parcel of the intervention is working with law enforcement to do this effectively. The other thing I love about this photo is the second floor here. This is actually an outpatient or a um, sort of short-term residential treatment facility. People can actually be referred directly from the injection room, which I'll show you, to treatment on the second floor. So here you actually have a co-location of harm reduction and treatment facilities in the building itself. So I'm going to take you into the facility now, and then we'll go through some of the research. Um, I find what's very helpful is to show people a movie and then kind of explain the process of how this works. So people enter into the clinic, uh, they register anonymously, and then enter into the injection room. There are 12 booths here. People, uh, nurses and social workers stand behind them. Uh, they provide sterile injection equipment and then people consume at one of these booths. The mirrors allow the nurses to watch for an overdose and then intervene in the case of someone nodding off. So that's basically what they're doing. They're watching and intervening in the case of an overdose. And this is a typical injection kit that people are given here. Nurses cannot inject people, so you have to be able to inject yourself, which is, which is a, a, a key sort of issue that they, they struggle with to this day. So I want to show you a movie now just to show you the flow of the facility and also Darwin, the manager, who I used to know well, he has a lovely Canadian accent, which I really love. So I'm going to um, hopefully this works, show you this here. Okay. When somebody comes to Insight and decides that they need to use the service, the first thing that happens is the staff is going to take them aside for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And that's really important. We don't just throw paperwork at people. We talk to them about their drug use pattern, why they're here, why they need to use the site, and we tell them what the site can offer, and we make sure that they know that the site is for them. It's for their health care, it's an important social contact for people, it's an important place of respite. So after we've had that conversation, if they decide to sign up, we'll sign them up quickly, and we'll give them a code name that they can use, so they can use the site anonymously. After that, people <coughs> can go into the wait room, where they wait to get into the injection room, and there's staff there to chat with them about how they're doing, and uh, make sure that they feel comfortable in the site. They'll go into the IR, they'll be given a booth, they'll be shown the array of clean equipment that we have, which is broader than most legal exchanges can offer. We'll show them things like where the sinks are, so they can wash their hands with some soap and water before they use. It's incredibly important, small things like that. They can talk to a nurse while they inject, they can learn safer injection techniques, they can see the nurse after they're done for some wound treatment if it's necessary, then they can go grab a cup of coffee afterwards in the chill lounge or a cup of juice, and we can talk about some of the broader issues. We can talk about what it's like to live in the downtown east side. Um, if this person is homeless, we can talk about housing. If this person needs methadone, we can get them in touch with that. If a person wants to talk about detox, we can tell them about on-site upstairs. Great, great, you know, great site for people to go to where we can just look at them, treat them as human beings, treat them with respect, and say, what do you need? All right. <clears throat> so as you, as you see in the video, I think what surprised a lot of people is the volume um, of flow through the facility. About 700 visits a day, it operates at capacity. Um, 
Only about 60% of those visits involve use of the injection room. There are peer counselors present, psychiatrists, uh, and social workers in another room attached to the injection room. So many people actually use the facility for those resources, not just for supervised consumption. Um, in 2016, there were 1,700 overdose incidents. That's much higher than I used to see when I worked there. Um, that's predominantly due to fentanyl. Um, and thousands of interventions and referrals to health and social services. Um, importantly, there have been 3.6 million visits since it opened in 2013. And to this day, there has never been an overdose death in the history of the SIF, and there has never been an overdose death in any supervised consumption facility anywhere in the world. So this shows you that overdose death is always preventable. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's that overdose death does not need to happen. We can always intervene, even in the case of a fentanyl overdose, there are always options for reviving that person and bringing them back. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'll talk about next, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's where I, I heard about the idea. Yeah. One thing that I forgot to mention is that this facility was opened under a Section 56 exemption from the Canadian uh, Controlled Substances Act. So that basically exempts people from drug possession laws in the facility itself. And that exemption was a legal mechanism that predated the SIF for medical and research purposes related to illicit drugs. I've been told by U.S. attorneys here that there is no such carve-out in the U.S. federal <laughs> possession laws. So from day one, this facility was legal federally under that exemption. That would not be the case if one were to be opened in the U.S. It would likely be illegal federally from day one. And so a lot of there, there's a lot of challenges around how to address that if one were to open uh, and a lot of debate. So uh, what I'll do is I'll take you through some of the research uh, that we did evaluating the SIF. I was interested in whether we actually could pick up community reductions in overdose rates. We know that people are not dying in the facility, but is that impacting uh, people in the community as a whole? So this was a study we published in The Lancet in 2011 that looked at this exact question. So what we did, uh, MG and I were both students at that time, we had access to a coroner's data set of all of the overdose deaths that had occurred uh, between 2001 and 2005, and Insight opened in September in 2003. So we designed just a very simple pre-post study. Um, we mapped where all of the overdose fatalities occurred, so they're shown in red, and the SIF is shown in yellow, so you can see most of the overdoses are happening in that downtown east side neighborhood. And then we basically compared the overdose rates before and after the facility opened. The vast majority of people who use the SIF live in this neighborhood, so we hypothesized that the impacts, if present, would be larger, largest in the downtown east side, and you shouldn't see an impact in the rest of the city of Vancouver because few people you know, uh, travel very far to use the facility. Uh, so these are the results. So what we did was we defined the downtown east side as any block, city block, um, within 500 meters of the SIF, and this was our quasi-control the rest of the city. So these are the number of overdoses in those areas before and after, and the person years at risk based on census data in those blocks. And these are the overdose rates and the difference in these rates. So you can see here we have a 35% reduction in overdose mortality after Insight opened in the downtown east side neighborhood, and only a 9% reduction in the city of Vancouver overall, suggesting that the opening did have some kind of impact. Um, that's a pretty basic pre-post comparison, so we did some more analyses as well. Um, this is showing visually what that looks like. These are the block-by-block -block overdose rates before Insight opened in the downtown east side. Insight shown in the star. And then the overdose rates afterwards, showing reductions pretty much in every city block in this neighborhood after the facility opened. When you do this spatial work, there's often what's called the um, spatial aerial unit problem, where the effect is determined by the unit of geography that you're looking at, which here is city block. So we did a sensitivity analysis. This is census tracts now, which are larger in Canada than a city block. Um, and this shows you basically the rate difference in overdose mortality before Insight open versus after. So if the dot is positive, that means there was a reduction in overdose after Insight opened. And, what you can, and then we basically just mapped census tracts based on the distance between Insight and the centroid of those census tracts. 
And the only two census tracts which had reductions in overdose were those that bounded the facility, and really Jen just noise and the rest of Vancouver overall. There's, of course, oft also possible confounding here. It's possible there were other policy changes over this time period. So we did look. There's, uh, there was a pre-existing cohort of people who inject drugs, which had been going on since 1996. So we looked at patterns in that cohort to see if maybe there was increases in people who were being arrested or ch up to increasing uptake of methadone, which might explain some of the reductions. And you can see here re really very stable trends in incarceration and methadone rates in this cohort before and after Insight opened. Just really a shift in drugs being used from um, less cocaine to more heroin. Uh, so not suggesting that there could be a confounding impacts here. So another question that my supervisor sought to answer was whether the SIF helps people quit drug use altogether, impacting the N, right? That's really what we want. We want to decrease the overdose risk, but also decrease the number at risk. So this was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006 that looked, exactly, looked at exactly this issue. Um, at this point in Vancouver, detox was really the only option. This is what I like to highlight when I give these talks, is that when these studies were done, addiction and opioid use disorder treatment was very limited. If one of these facilities were to open in Boston, the treatment linkages could be much more robust. Buprenorphine wasn't even a, a, a approved by Health Canada at this point. Um, but we looked at entry into detox in a random sample of SIF clients. Uh, so what we found here um, is that overall, 18% of people entered into detox over this 15-month period. So not extremely high rates of uptake of detox, um, but higher than what you saw in some of those pre-existing cohorts of people who were injecting. This is a survival model looking at factors that predicted uptake of detox in this random sample of SIF clients. And what we found was that more frequent use of the SIF and importantly contact with peer counselors in the facility were highly associated with an increased likelihood of uptake of detox. Which is interesting, right, because people that use the SIF more frequently are actually at higher risk and are probably have more severe opioid use disorder and severe addiction. So the fact that they're making contact more frequently and that predicted uptake of treatment is, is interesting uh, and showing the important impact of counselors working within the facility itself. Yeah. This was looking just at the detox programs, which were really the, the dominant form of treatment back in the early 2000s. Methadone has since expanded. That video is taken a little bit later, and buprenorphine is now available as well. Yeah. We did look, this was a follow-up study that my colleague Cora did looking at uptake of any treatment. This is just self-reported data in that random sample of SIF clients. Have you engaged in any treatment? Um, and so over a longer study period, after two years, 42% of people who were not in treatment at baseline had entered into some kind of treatment. Um, and again, the same kind of predictors of entry into treatment, regular attendance and contact with counselors, and obviously a history of treatment predicted subsequent entry into treatment as well. I just wanted to finish this little section on something that comes up a lot when I give these talks in Boston. <laughs> people are very, and, and other places too. People are very concerned that SIFs would actually increase neighborhood disorder in the neighborhoods in which they're implemented. So this was one study that was done to look at this issue. I really love this study design. We basically had students go out at random times throughout the day and count the number of people injecting in public, amount of injection-related litter, and amount of publicly discarded syringes six weeks prior to the opening of the SIF and up to 12 weeks afterwards. And you can see significant reductions in all of the measures of in public injection drug use and injection-related litter after the SIF opened. And in a multivariable model, they adjusted for weather, policing patterns, and other factors, and this still was significant. Subsequent studies have been done which actually show also reductions in crime in the downtown east side neighborhood after the SIF opened. Those were actually done by uh, some American uh, investigators looking at VPD, Vancouver Police Department data. So I wanted to finish the last 10 minutes or so on some new research that I've been doing here at Brown on fentanyl testing, coming back to this fentanyl issue. 
Um, this is some work um, that actually I learned about from Vancouver. Uh, so uh, the benefit of having supervised consumption is that you can also add on other interventions. So this was a technology uh, that was actually developed by a Canadian company, BTNX, that develops what are called fentanyl test strips. These are almost like a pregnancy test. They allow you to identify fentanyl contamination in illicit drug samples. They started piloting these at the SIF probably around two years ago, just asking people if they'd be willing to test their drugs prior to consumption. I heard about this, and, and other people in the harm reduction world in the US did as well, and said, boy, maybe this would be an effective way to address our fentanyl crisis, even outside of the context of supervised consumption. Um, but at that point, there was really no research on whether, these, whether people would be interested in using these or whether they would work. So that's what we sought uh, to do, was answer some of these questions. We did a very small pilot study here at Brown, just with 95 uh, young adults who are at risk for overdose, predominantly using heroin. We sought to answer some questions and concerns just in this pilot context. You know, what is the risk of false negatives with this intervention? Will people use the strips to seek fentanyl? That's a common perception that we have because it's such a potent opioid. Um, do people struggle using the tests? And, and will they actually result in harm reduction behaviors in practice? So these are the questions that we sought to answer just in this pilot. I'm trying to get funding now for a larger randomized control trial. So stay tuned. Hopefully the NIH will look positively upon me. <laughs> um, so this is what shows the, the tests here. Uh, they are rather confusing. One line is positive for fentanyl. Two lines are negative, kind of the opposite of a pregnancy test. So <laughs> in, our, in our pilot, we found that that's the biggest problem. We actually made stickers and affixed stickers to every single individually labeled package that showed people how to interpret them. And that really helped uh, to make sure that people interpret them correctly. The issue with false negatives is interesting. A couple of my colleagues, Tracy Green in Boston and Susan Sherman at Hopkins, did a great validation study uh, working with labs in Rhode Island and Baltimore. And they are extremely sensitive and very specific, like 96% sensitivity and 94% specificity for identifying fentanyl. They're almost too sensitive. They pick up nanograms of fentanyl that is clinically not meaningful. So I'm actually more concerned about false positives at this point than false negatives. But better to be too sensitive, I would say, than, than the opposite. And our, I'll show you some results that get to this issue. All right, so just to sort of take you through the study, again, this is a very small pilot. We recruited 95 young adults who were using illicit drugs, predominantly heroin, or we also enrolled people who were using stimulants because of this risk of fentanyl contamination in the stimulant supply. And we just recruited them through bus ads, uh, word of mouth, and on the internet as well. So we did actually divide people into two arms. This was because the test uh, actually was meant to be used for urine samples. So when we first started this, we did want to kind of use the product as indicated. So we actually did ask people to test their urine post-consumption. People did do this. I was surprised. Uh, <laughs> but after Tracy's study came out showing that they are effective at identifying fentanyl in dissolved in water, we did switch the protocol and asked and trained people to use fentanyl test strips prior to consumption. I'll just pool the data for today. There was really not a lot of difference between the two arms, which did surprise me. Um, so we basically brought people in, trained them how to use the tests, gave them 10 strips to use at home, and then followed them uh, two weeks later with a short interview, just asked them whether they used them and what happened. So these are some results from the baseline. Um, just to give you an idea of the sample here, we had a pretty good distribution of sex and gender and, and race ethnicity, sort of reflecting people at risk of overdose in Rhode Island. Pretty high risk sample, over half had ever injected, over a third had reported a prior overdose, and two thirds of people had witnessed an overdose. This is a major problem, a lot of exposure to witnessing overdose among people who use drugs. At baseline, the vast majority said they would use them and plan to use the strips. So the follow-up data will look to see whether that actually happened. So this is the results from the follow-up. So we had 90-some-odd people in total. We were able to bring back 87% of people. 
and t three quarters of those reported using at least one strip in that two to four week period. And most of the people who said they didn't use a strip said that they just didn't plan on using drugs in those two week periods. So if I'd redesigned the study, I would have had a longer follow up period. These again are younger people. Some are using heroin daily and others are using more you know, casually on the weekends. So that, that we, I wish we had accounted for. Um, but of the people that used at least one strip, 50% said they got a positive. This just shows you the penetration of fentanyl in the illicit drug supply. So what we really wanted to look at was any indication of behavioral change after getting a positive test. So we asked people, after you got a positive test, what did you do? And these are some of the quantitative results. Um, about half reported using smaller amounts, 40% reported using more slowly, 40% uh, reported using with someone else around. That's really what we want to do from a harm reduction point of view. One of the biggest risks of overdose death is using alone. So we really want to encourage people to use with friends and also stagger. I've seen several cases of people using drugs together and going down at the same time and then actually both dying. So that can happen. So the messaging here reads, needs to be really specific around using and staggering. Um, and then other people did report doing what's called a tester shot, just a small amount. Only 10% threw their drugs out. So again, this is a harm reduction intervention. People still use. The idea is to help people use more safely. Um, when we looked at, we, at baseline, we did ask people, what are the types of things you do to avoid overdose? Most people said nothing. And so after getting a positive result, 68% of people reported some kind of behavioral, positive behavioral change, um, engaging in some of what we would call more positive risk reduction practices. So a strong effect there just in this small sample. I just wanted to, uh, oh yes, and people really liked them. Um, almost 100% of people were confident in their ability to use them. Even the people asked to test their urine, that kind of amazed me. Um, and people really liked them. They wanted to continue using them um, and said they'd be willing to obtain them um, at harm reduction organizations, in pharmacies, at clinics. So I wanted to finish now, I like finishing with the voices of people who use drugs, and also I think this is where you see a lot of powerful narratives. We just published this study, one of my students led this uh, qualitative work um, showing kind of what, how people reacted to getting a, a positive test. Um, and this speaks to the fact that, that people know about the harms of fentanyl and they really do wish to avoid it. Um, so this person said, they're 20 years old, um, but fentanyl's gonna show up in the test so it's kind of worth it. What I'm saying is you could save your life by using this, or you could not use it and do what you're going to do and be dead. I thought it came out positive, so I got rid of the fentanyl. So this person actually did report discarding their drugs altogether. Um, this person who is 28 and male um, said everything about the test was useful. They opened my eyes and it saved my life. I can gladly say I haven't taken any more because I was gonna take two bags of heroin. Um, if I took these two bags, I think I wasn't even gonna be here right now. And finally, uh, I find this one quite powerful. Um, I would definitely say we were a lot more cautious about what we were doing, like definitely a lot more ready for something to go wrong. I definitely would pace myself a lot slower with the drugs. And you know, it was like I said, it's kind of sad to say, but we were almost expecting an overdose. And so if that did happen, you know at least somebody could be like, oh, jump on it and act fast. So this sort of shows you, you know, even if people are still going to use in the context of these fentanyl test strips, people around might intervene more quickly because they know it's a fentanyl overdose. And with fentanyl overdoses, minutes matter. So, it, you know, it's, it's interesting how people responded to this technology and the information in different ways. So uh, what I wanted to finish to kind of come back to the policy responses has been very interesting for me. As I mentioned, with supervised consumption in the US, you see a lot of controversy and a lot of challenges legally with implementing them that I'd love to talk more about. With fentanyl test strips in Rhode Island, we saw very much the, uh, the opposite uh, response. Um, some legislators sponsored a bill to formally uh, legalize the strips, which was passed unanimously by the Senate and signed into law. So this codifies the ability to distribute fentanyl test strips and use them without fear of persecution. We did this through basically just expanding the Good Samaritan law that exists in Rhode Island, so providing further protections for people who may be distributing these tests or may be using them. 
So it, you know, it was um, relatively successful. We've been handing them out now. Um, they were first handed out on Overdose Awareness Day in Rhode Island. Here's a picture of one of our public events with um, someone receiving an overdose prevention kit uh, and that contains fentanyl test strips. So the uptake of these has been really very positive in Rhode Island and the policy response has, has really been right at the, the forefront of the intervention. So a nice sort of comparison for you in these two harm reduction uh, programs. Uh, and there they, there they are. So that's all I have. I just want to thank the study participants for their countless contributions. Uh, the photos by MJ Malloy of Insight and all my wonderful colleagues. Uh, the original SIF funded was, evaluation was funded by Health Canada. And funding for the fentanyl test strip was funded by a center grant from NIH and also the Brown University Office for the Vice President of Research. So that is all I have. And uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.